being taught by our brother Burleson, Ephesians. What a wonderful, wonderful epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote and given some good instructions. It is known as a Magna Carta among some commentators, and you've studied it enough to understand why it would be the Magna Carta. The Apostle Paul says there in Ephesians, <clears throat> and in chapter 6 and in verse 13, Therefore, take up the full armor of God. As we've been going through our lessons, sermons, and Bible studies this year, our hope has been to gear and focus all of these lessons to our yearly theme. Be strong in the Lord. And it comes from this passage, actually from this entire book, where the Apostle Paul is saying to the Corinthian brethren, put on the entire armor, be ready, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having everything or done everything, he then says, stand firm. Then the rest of the chapter tells us what we need to stand firm against. We need to stand firm against all those evil powers that surround us, evil forces that surround us, the devil and his demons, the devil and those evil angels that that, that are there to influence us to do evil things. And I say to you, brethren, that if we would be more focused in fighting against the common enemy, which is the devil, and not fighting against each other, we would be more victorious. But many times we we focus so much on, on destroying each other, on nitpicking each other, on bringing each other down, pride and nephew, you know, all those sins that Adam and Eve were, were plagued with, the sins, uh, the temptations that the devil brought against Jesus, that that the devil just sits back and says, I really don't have to, do, to worry about anything. But this is what Paul is saying. You need to take up the full armor of God. All of the pieces of the armor are for defense, and only one is offense, which would be the sword. Stand firm. So this month has been focused on the fundamentals, on the basic things. And it's very important for us to understand why we need sometimes to remind it of some of those things that you and I believe we already know. You see, it was the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 5 and verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers. By this time you you should have no need of going back and and really reestablishing the foundational things. Because the Hebrew writer wanted to move past those foundational things and talk about some solid, meaty, heavier things or weightier things of, of the Word. But he was finding out that some of those brethren could not understand and could not handle some of those things. He says, you have need again for someone to come back and teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God. Did you notice that phrase, of the actual words of God? Which, through necessary inference, it means that someone was not teaching them the actual words of God. Somehow they had been forgetting the actual words of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. And then he goes on and describes what those things were that that he had to go and reestablish. Simple things like the commandments of God. Things like the deity of Christ. There were some brethren there that, that weren't believing or had forgotten that Jesus is Christ, that Jesus is God. And you'd be surprised how many members of the body of Christ that you know don't believe that Jesus is God. 
he was going to have to go back and teach him about repentance, about faith. Well, I wish it would advance on me. And about baptism, the resurrection of the dead, and even eternal judgment. Now, that's not to shame any of us. Because so many times we move on in our Christian walk, and we start studying a lot of other things that we forget to go back and reestablish. We, go, we forget to go and revisit the things that we should already know. So this morning, I'd like for us to look at the Lord's Supper, something that we partake of every Sunday, something that we look at, rather, that we participate in every Sunday, the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread, and we set a special time apart for it. But, you know, you might want to ask your little children what the Lord's Supper is about, and they might not know. They might believe it's just something that we do. And let this be a refresher course for some. And for some of you, it might be something that you have forgotten why we do these things. So turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 16, as a springboard passage, the Apostle Paul says in verse 16, he asks a question. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Now, that's quite interesting for him to include verse 16 in this chapter. This is the only mention of the Lord's Supper or the emblems in this chapter. Later on in the next chapter, uh, verses 22 through the end of the chapter, verse 34, I believe, he, he expounds on the Lord's Supper, but here he's talking about Moses and the children of Egypt and out in the wilderness and serpents and grumbling. And then right here, verse, this, there's verse 16, he talks about the Lord's table. Seems like it's out of place. But let's read this passage one more time and then make a, a, a chapter context connection. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ. The key word to understand what Paul is talking about is sharing. Sharing. Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ. So the word sharing is in here twice. Let's go to the first verse. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So the entire idea in this chapter has to do with sharing or fellowship, communion. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, which would be the manna that came from heaven, and all drank the same spiritual drink. They were drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were, they were laid low in the wilderness. Now, these things happened to them so that it would serve as an example to us. That's what that next verse says, so that we would not make the same mistakes. And it goes on to describe the mistakes that they made. They grumbled, they murmured, they complained. God sent fiery serpents. They all died in the wilderness. So here's the point that Paul makes here. They all shared together. We're all baptized into Moses and the cloud. They all shared of the same bread and of the same spiritual rock. They all drank from the same rock. But here's the problem. They didn't do it with the right purpose and in the right attitude. Because while they were supposed to be doing things out of gratitude, they were supposed to be doing things with the right spirit. While they were eating the bread and drinking from the same rock, they were also complaining and murmuring. Do you see the connection now? When we partake of the Lord's Supper, how should we do it? We should be examining ourselves making sure that we are doing it with the right mindset. 
That's the point. When you read verse 17, he talks about something, the table and the demons, the Jews in the wilderness, because when they were eating of the bread, the manna that came from heaven, their attitude was, is this all we have, this miserable, miserable bread that comes from heaven, uh, from, from, the, from, from the skies? We wish that we were back in Egypt where we had onions and leeks, where we had all these other things. They were never fully committed to God. One of the wonderful things about the Lord's Supper that we're going to see is commitment to God. We are partaking of his spiritual blood, of his spiritual body, which also resembles our commitment to him. That's our springboard passage here. That's how we introduce the Lord's Supper. So, who instituted the Lord's Supper? I want us to think about the what and the why when it comes to the, to the Lord's Supper. And it's not something that, that was invented by man. It was not a, a traditional thing that sounded good, that felt good, that, that would, would have made a lot of good sense if the New Testament church started doing it. It was actually Jesus himself. He personally instituted the Lord's Supper as a memorial to himself. And if Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, then maybe we ought to do what he did as a commandment for us, as an example for us that we should follow. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul said to one of the most divided churches in the New Testament, he said, for I received... This could be very well understood as, for I personally received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, he took bread. So when the Apostle Paul gives to the Corinthians the instructions on the Lord's Supper, he is saying to them, I received from Jesus the instructions just as I am giving them to you. Jesus in Matthew 26, verse 17, or, or, or Matthew records it this way. On the first day of the unleavened bread, the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? It was during the Passover feast, 49 days plus one, which would have been on a Sunday, that they come to Jesus and say, where do you want to partake? this Passover meal. So in Mark chapter 14 and verse 22, while they were eating, he took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to them. And notice what Jesus says. Take it. This is my body. Verse 23, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, the fruit of the vine, of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now jump down to verse 25. Now, Truly, I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So Jesus here very specifically and succinctly instituted, but, but there's more. Look, look at Mark. Uh, or rather Luke chapter 22 and verse 17. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. Now, what was in that cup? I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom comes. And when he had taken some bread and given it to them, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I, I cite all of these passages to illustrate and to prove the point that the Lord's Supper was not something introduced by man, not a figment of man's imagination, but Jesus himself instituted it on the day of Passover of unleavened bread, and he commanded it. 
take it, eat it, take it, and drink from it. But I think it's quite important that we know what emblems were used and why they were used. I think it's important that we understand why we don't use Coca-Cola and cheese crackers. You know what I'm having for lunch? Green beef enchiladas and red enchiladas and black beans and Mexican rice. That would make a good supper, wouldn't it? But you know why we don't have stuff like that for the Lord's Supper? You're welcome to come if you want. I'm going to show you in the scriptures why we don't use whatever we want for the Lord's Supper. It matters to God. In the Bible, it does not say the church of Ed. In the Bible, it says the Lord's church or the church of Christ or the church of the firstborn. Read with me, if you will, to begin with in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 29, a passage that we just looked at here uh, quite briefly. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine. From now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Fruit of the vine is the grape vine, fruit of the vine. Now, someone might say, well, if, if Jesus had had a, at his disposal the great Texas drink called Dr. Pepper, he would have done it. He would have used it. No. No, he specifically, remember we started with a passage that says his disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to prepare this Passover meal for you? There was time for preparation. There was energy spent in preparing a special place in preparing enough or with enough time to prepare to buy the things that were needed for the Passover. It was calculated based on what Jesus needed for this supper when he instituted it. In Mark chapter 14 and in verse 23, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said, truly, I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. In Luke 22 and verse 20, I think it's the clearest passage. In the same way, he, uh, uh, he took the cup after they had eaten, and he says, this cup which is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. But what about, what about the, the bread? We make quite a bit ado about the kind of bread that we use for the Lord's Supper, don't we? I don't like the bread that we eat. But again, it's not about me. We use unleavened bread, and there's a reason for it. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 17, notice what the scripture says. And this is one of the best ways to explain how bi biblical authority is established through necessary inference. That is an inference that has to be drawn and no other inference can be concluded or inferred. Now on the first day, Matthew 26 verse 17, now on the first day of the unleavened bread or the festival of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? What do we know about the unleavened bread or the feast of the unleavened bread? Well, when you turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12 and in verse 15, in order for the people, the Jews, to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they had to prepare their homes by cleaning out the entire house, cupboards, pantries, and all, 
sweeping, mopping, dusting to remove all and any trace of leavening agent. No yeast could be in the home. Nothing that was considered a leavening agent could be ha had inside the house. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be put out of the city, be cut off from Israel. Verse 16. On the first day you shall have, only, you shall have a holy assembly and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. That alone may be prepared by you. Verse 17. We're going to go through about verse uh, 20 or 19. You shall also observe the feast of the unleavened bread. For on this day, he explains to them, on this day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month of the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. And seven days there shall be no leaven found, verse 19, in your houses. For whoever, whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land, anything that is leavened, anything that, 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 that yeast makes grow or ferment, they could not have in their home, they could not eat. If they did, it was considered such a gross, negligent sin that they had to be cast out of Israel. And what do I know about my Lord Jesus? Hebrews 4 and verse 15, in whom there was no sin, Jesus did not commit any sin. So when he instituted the Lord's Supper, we know for a fact that it had to be non-fermented grape juice and unleavened bread. And when he says, do this in my memory, we have to follow his commandment. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we partake of the Lord's Supper with a frequency called once a week. There's a reason why we do it every Sunday, every first day of the week. But before I, I give you the passages, I want to use some common sense reasoning with you, some logical reasoning. There's nowhere in the Old Testament where God said to the Jews, keep every, key word every, every Sabbath.